driven away, so drive them as we- them away, as wax melts before the fire. Let the wicked f- perish before God. But let the righteous be joyful. Let them exult before God. Let them be jubilant with joy. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides upon the clouds. His name is the Lord. Be exultant before him. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord. O rider in the heavens, the ancient heavens. Listen, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God in his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. O Lord, we lift our hearts and minds and voices to you. We declare that you are the one true and living God, revealed through Jesus Christ, that you have sent your Son on our behalf, and that you, having handed him over, raised him up, and exalted him to your right hand, through him have sent to us your Spirit. And now as your people, we are empowered to do your work in the world. And so we ask that by our time of worship together, that you would strengthen us, encourage us, inspire us to do that work. Oh Lord, we bring before you many needs this morning. We bring before you the needs for healthy children. We bring before you the needs for loved ones who are sick and in need of your presence, your healing, and your watch care. Oh, Lord, we bring before you the needs of minds and hearts that are troubled and long for direction and consolation. And so, Heavenly Father, as children 
who nestle up against their mothers and seek comfort and peace, so we too bring ourselves into your presence. We pray that you would hide us in your own arms and strength. We pray that you would comfort us and give us your peace. We love you, we bless you, and we ask you, Heavenly Father, to inspire and encourage our worship and enable us in these moments, we pray, to hear your voice. We pray in the name of Christ. We pray now together as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to this time of offertory, hear now the word of the Lord from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. There are four different ways that you can give uh, here uh, to the work of Christ at Heights Church by cash or check in an offering plate, by mail, by sending a text message through our website. All these are listed on the back of your bulletin, but the most important thing is to give in the way that God has led you. The most important thing is to give cheerfully with a joyful heart. And so as we prepare uh, to give back to God for his great blessings, we will sing an offertory hymn together that reminds us of, I think, a most important thing and that all is God's. All that we have and all that we are is God's. It's hymn number 17. This is my father's world. Would you join me in standing to sing?
Please join me in our offertory prayer. Dear Lord, we're just so thankful for this day, this opportunity to be here and worship you here at Heights Church. We're thankful for each person and family that's represented here. We say a special prayer for the newborns here at our church and those that are coming soon. We're so thankful for, for them and pray for their families. What blessings. We pray for our, our church. We pray for this Heights community and the city of Houston and this entire world. And we just pray that we will do your will. We will follow your lead and being the light for you to others. And we just want to thank you for the staff that, that serves our church faithfully, their families that support them, and this amazing congregation. Pray that others will come join us in the days ahead. And we, again, we just thank you so much. All the blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The gospel lesson for this morning is from John 17, verses 1 through 11. John 17, verse 1 through 11. That's page 85 in your uh, pew Bible, if you'd like to look at that. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. 
since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they're yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I've been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thursday, we celebrated, uh, in the church calendar, you celebrate the ascension, uh, Christ's ascension to uh, the right hand of the Father, to the heavenly space, um, to be seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, we don't often meet on Thursdays in this church, and so um, I'm going to talk about the ascension today on, on Sunday. John 17 uh, gets at that, that closing line, which says, I'm coming to you, I'm no longer in the world, for I go to my Father, um, and I, you know, he gives the Spirit to his people. Um, the, other, the other text we might have read was, was from Acts 1, where it, is, it narrates Christ's ascension, narrates his ascension um, after talking with his disciples for 40 days about the kingdom of God, teaching them, and then he rises to go into the heavenly space, and they watch him go, and an angel says, why are you watching? In the same way that he went, he'll come back. Um, the funny, to me, uh, funny, funny thing about the ascension um, is it, It might be the single most event in the new, single most important event in the New Testament. Right? The ascension might be the single most important event in the New Testament. Um, that's obviously a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, so now that I've exaggerated it, and you can take it as an exaggeration, I'm going to say it one more time so it sticks. The ascension might be the single most important event in the New Testament. Ironically, the uh, the importance of it. The importance of the ascension is only matched, ironically, by how little importance we actually ascribe to it. Um, so I'm going to just name a few things. We'll talk about it all. But I'm going to name a few things that the New Testament explicitly hinges upon the ascension. So here are all the things that we get as believers because of the ascension or as a result of the ascension. Okay? Forgiveness of sins. It seems important. Atonement and purification. Spiritual protection. Spiritual gifts. Uh, the reminder that the one who is exalted is our judge. Sort of keeps you in line. Uh, an authoritative teacher on the throne. Uh, the grounds for all nations worshiping God. We get the Spirit itself and constant intercession before the Father. So again, each of these things is named as something that we get as a result of the ascension. So I'll say some of those again. Forgiveness, atonement, spiritual protection, spiritual gifts, the reminder that the one who's in heaven is our judge and so we should all be good to each other. Um, a teacher who teaches us how to act and uh, how, how we ought to act, uh, the grounds for all nations belonging together um, under the lordship of Jesus, uh, the very spirit itself is a result of the ascension, the, the fact that we are possessed by the spirit, and a con one who constantly intercedes on our behalf. Those are all things that the New Testament explicitly names as a result of the ascension. And to say it negatively, without the ascension, you don't have those things. It's probably a stronger way to put it, but it gets the point across. Um, so we're going to talk about all of these. Uh, that's nine points. Yikes. 
All right, that's nine things. You think we can do them all? And here's the deal. I know that a lot of these are sort of theological terms like forgiveness, atonement, uh, spiritual protection. And to be honest, when I hear those words, my eyes glaze over because you just, you hear those words all the time. You're like, you're in church. I've heard the word forgiveness a thousand times. So uh, with each of these, I've attached a little like two minutes story from my life to help get some of these across, okay? Um, one or two of them are a bit risky, so just stay with me, okay? Um, let's talk about forgiveness. Uh, when I lived in St. Andrews, I, uh, I, I was doing a, my, my degree work. I was doing my uh, doctoral work there. Um, the first week, I made friends with the librarian. It's one of the smartest things I did. Uh, because she was great. She was like a, 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 a third mom to me there. Um, and um, the, we, made, we, we made friends, we, we became friends in like week one, and then I was there for four years. And so um, I knew that, you know, if I was ever late on a book, that she was just sort of going to look the other way and just say, okay, don't do it again, wink, wink, and it's okay. Um, as long as I sort of made my best effort, right? I wasn't going to try to kind of keep the books off to myself. Um, but if I, you know, made my effort, she would, she would just kind of uh, paper it over. Uh, the problem is, is that she was a librarian at the small library. Uh, the main campus library was this, you know, across the town. And you couldn't make friends with people there because they were all, you know, like bureaucratic Brits, right? And so, like, you couldn't make friends with these people. And uh, one time, the problem was I didn't return my books before I went home for summer. <sighs> so I got back... <clears throat> I got back, and I went to check out a book. They're like, sorry, you can't actually check out any more books. I was like, well, this is important. Um, I've got to write a dissertation. I really need this book. And they're like, okay, well, let me just uh, let me see what kind of, how many books you have out. She, t she typed out something, and a receipt that looked like it came from CVS came out. <laughs> and I was like, what's on that? She goes, that's all your books. And I was like, why is it so long? She goes, it's naming all your fines. I was like, oh, great. It's a pound. At the time, the, the exchange rate was a pound was almost $2. A pound a day per book. I had maxed out my books at like 60. I had all the books I could get. I said, 60 books at $2 a day for about three and a half months. <laughs> And I couldn't return them because I was overseas. And I was like, kept getting emails. I was like, I really hope that a lot of these are to the good library. Um, got there, and I was like, look. Come on. <laughs> I was like, I lived in Texas. I tried to do it. And I don't know. I was like, I, I did actually try one time to return them digitally, and it wouldn't work. Because um, they're like, you know, you can't return books digitally. There are like physical things you have to give back to the library. And they're like, well, um, this lady, nicest lady ever, she goes, all right, well, you tried. I was like, yeah, I really did. She goes, and you were in Texas the whole time? I was like, I was in Texas the whole time, and I just like, I didn't. I was like, I also just got married. Does that help? And she was like, uh, actually, yeah, that's fine. And she just canceled it. And I was like, I was a PhD student. You know how much money I had? I, yeah, I was a PhD student. I had no money. Um, I was like, I, as soon as your debt's canceled, like, imagine how good you feel, particularly as somebody with no money. And I was going like, to have to draw on my wife's saving account to, just to pay this library debt. Uh, but it got canceled. And I was like, oh, thank you. Bridget, I think was her name. Um, so forgiveness. This is uh, Acts 5 says that you get forgiveness of sins. Um, through the exaltation. So here's Acts 5. It says, the God of our fathers, this is Peter's sermon in Acts 5, says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had to put to death by hanging him on a cross. He's the one whom God exalted to his right hand. So this is the ascension. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior in order to grant repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins is hinged upon Christ's exaltation explicitly named as the thing that you get as a result of the exaltation in Acts 5. I'm going to tie all these together at the end, but I'm going to move on. Okay, atonement. Uh, atonement's one of those, uh, another classic sort of big Bible theological term. Uh, even scholars are not even exactly clear like what we even mean by the word atonement anymore. Um, atonement in the uh, sacrificial context, it means a lot of things. At the most basic sense, it means restoring the relationship between the two parties. So the party that gets offended and the party that's the offender, they get restored, and they can be at one now. Um, that's kind of actually the etymological point behind atonement. If you see the word written out, you see the word at one. You become at one again. Um, but what would happen in the... Uh, 
in the um, Levitical system is the commission of sin would, wouldn't just have a, a damaging effect between the two relationships. It would also actually have a damaging effect <clears throat> on the temple itself. So God resided in the temple and the commission of sin and the impurities of the people, they could actually end up defiling the temple itself. And if the temple got so defiled uh, and, never got, and that never got remedied, the divine presence would depart it. And that actually happens in Ezekiel 10. But the remedy for that is sacrifice. The blood from the sacrifice is applied to the altar and the blood from the altar, or the blood from the sacrifice, functions as like ritual 409. That's like ritual countertop detergent. It cleanses the sacred space. Is 409 still a brand? I don't know. Okay. Uh, For those of you who don't clean countertops, it's like countertop spray for altars. Um, You apply it to the altar and it cleanses it. This is the explicitly named purpose of the sacrifices in Leviticus 16. It says you go in there and you apply the the blood of the sacrifices and it cleanses the sacred space. And with the cleansing of the sacred space, the divine presence stays there. And because it was your sin that defiled the altar, because the altar gets cleansed, it has a positive effect on you as well. So you cleanse the sacred space, it has the result of also cleansing you. And so what can happen as a result is the divine presence stays in the temple, and you, having been, having been cleansed, can go to the temple. So, in other words, God and you can stay together. Um... The best example I've come up with this uh, when I teach this um, in in my classes is uh, when you have a newborn baby. Um, And what happens when you have a newborn baby and say the mom had COVID or something? In these in these last couple years, the 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 protocol at the time was well, if you have COVID and you give birth to a baby and that baby then has to go to the ICU for whatever reason, you actually can't um, be in the same room together because the baby's immune system is so weak and you have a debilitating, you know, uh, uh, you have COVID, and so y'all can't be in the same room together. Baby's got to go here, mom's got to go here. This is devastating. You want to hold your baby as soon as it comes out. I'm a dad and I want that. I can imagine, like, the mom who's carried this baby for nine months really wants it, right? Um, But there's, the only solution to this is to cleanse your body of the sickness and to cleanse the baby of its so that y'all can be in the same room. Even in, even in less dire states, you've ever been to a hospital before, which I know lots of us have, what do they make you do? What do you do right when you walk in? They're like, do you have a cold? And you're like, no. All right, well, before you walk in, make sure you Purell your hands before you walk into this room. You have to absolutely cleanse everything, a, a part of your body, before you enter into this room because the person you're visiting has a weak immune system. Now, the weakness of this analogy is it makes God the one with the weak immune system, but the point stays the same. What has to happen is, the, 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 the solution is that the person has to be cleansed for both parties to be together. And this is the way that uh, the author of Hebrews talks about what Christ did when he ascended into the heavenly space. So let's read, um, read Hebrews 9. Here's Hebrews 9, 9 to 14. It said, accordingly, uh, when we're referring to the sacrifices that were offered in the Jerusalem temple, he said, uh, gifts and sacrifices were offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience because they only relate to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not with the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered into the holy place once for all, having obtained redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifer and sprinkling can, uh, can, can uh, help those who've been defiled, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish, how much more will he cleanse your conscience? from dead works to serve the living God. So Hebrews has this conception of a temple in the heavenly space where Christ entered into this temple that exists in the heavenly space and there he cleansed that temple with the result that you who participate in Christ are also cleansed. So that now, having both been cleansed, what can you do? Hebrews 7, you can draw near to God through him. He says, The former priests, on the one hand, they existed in great numbers, the Levitical priests. They had to have, you had to have a lot of them because they kept dying. 
But Christ, on the other hand, because he now lives forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Hence, also, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. So Christ, having purified the heavenly sanctuary, also purifies you so that you and God can draw near to each other. But the point for our purposes is that he ties this to Christ's exaltation. This is what he did when he entered into the heavenly space. Okay, third one, spiritual protection. This one's the risk. Let's see how we do. Um, I once got into bar fight. Okay, I did, that's not totally true. What happened is, is I was leaving Crickets. Um, Crickets is in Waco, and it's actually like a restaurant, bar, grill type place, you know? Um, so it wasn't really a bar, and it was the parking lot. I wasn't in the bar, I was in the parking lot, I was walking to my car, and it wasn't me, I didn't get in a fight, it was someone who came up to me and my buddy and said, hey, um, are y'all, can we hang out with you guys, is there a party? And we're like, no, we're going home. It's like 10 o'clock, and we like wanted to go to bed. And they're like, well, no, we're like, come on, like, tell, tell us where's the party at. And my, the guy I was with, it wasn't Marcus, just so you know, uh, the guy I was with um, <clears throat> was like, no, really, man, like, there's no party. We're just, we're just going home. And then I don't know what this guy was on or what was going on, but he just charged him. He charged my buddy um, and started throwing punches. Um, he, my, my friend was a strong guy. I, I wish I could say it was his first, first fight. It was not his first fight that he'd ever been in. Um, and so he was, he was doing fine. The problem was there were five of them um, and just me and my buddy. And I don't fight. Um, I try to obey Jesus. And, um, and so this other guy looked at me, just made eye contact with me. Like, are we going to fight? And I literally looked at him and just said, no, please don't. <laughs> And, um, and he got that look in his eyes and he just wound up like this. And I just like took a step back and I was like, buddy, why I'm not fighting you. And he, and he actually goes, all right, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and he just backed up. But now my buddy is fighting and he's getting other, three other guys started attacking him. And you know what happened? I had like befriended a bodybuilder that night inside Cricket's. We just become buddies. We, we were talking at, at uh, I think we were playing pool or something. We were talking. And he just was like a really nice guy. And he was huge. And he just happened to walk out at that time. He walked outside and goes, hey, is everything all right out here? And they all looked up at him. And they were like, yes, it is. We are all doing great. And he goes, you guys can leave. And they got in their car and drove away. And that was it. That was how it ended. Because this one huge bodybuilder guy stepped out and said, hey, is everything all right here? And I was like, I think we could use some help. And he goes, all right. And he just took one step closer and they all literally got up and ran away. That's a true story, by the way. Um, not, 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 a, besides, I called it a bar fight just to be risky, but um, it wasn't really, it was just a parking lot fight outside of crickets. Uh, Ninfas is right there. It wasn't really a bar. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is what Paul says of Christ in Ephesians. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we have this struggle, not against flesh and blood, but against other rulers, against the powers and world forces of the darkness. But guess what? With the strength of God, God raised Christ from the dead and, Ephesians 1, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and every power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things, including these people we war against, the spiritual powers that we war against, he put all of them in subjection under his feet and gave Christ as head over all things. So we are in a struggle, but God has seated at his right hand someone who has subjected all these parking lot fighters under him. Okay, I have nine stories, but we don't have time for that. So I'm going to uh, skip a couple of these stories, but uh, get you the, the, the theological point. Um, the other thing you get is uh, spiritual gifts. 
Um, In Ephesians, Paul says, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men, gave gifts to humans. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he had also descended into the lower parts, namely the earth, Um, and that he who descended is himself also the same one who ascended far above all heavens, so that he might fill all things. And once ascended, he, quote, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers, but all for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of service to to the building up of the body of Christ. That at Christ's ascension, he then distributed gifts to his people. And these gifts that we have of teaching, singing, uh, uh, um, evangelizing, um, um, all all the various gifts that, that, that the saints have, they are for the purpose of equipping each other and building each other up. And this is as a result of the spiritual gifts that he gave us when he was exalted. Okay, uh, the next one. <clears throat> We have a reminder, Paul says, uh, these two come from Paul as well, Uh, through the ascension or the exaltation, we have a reminder that the one who is in heaven is the judge of all of us. And this is a sobering thought. You get it in a few spots, particularly in Paul's letters, Ephesians and Romans again, but it's the fact that Paul's able to remind his community is that, look, the one who's enthroned at the right hand of the Father is also the one who's going to judge, and he's the judge of all of us. And because he's going to judge you, and you, and you, and you, and me, we don't get to judge each other. We don't get to take on Christ's role of judgment. And this matters with the way that he um, passes his, um, gives his moral exhortation, for example, in Ephesians 6. When he's, at the, at the time in Ephesians 6, the institution of slavery was still um, active, and so he's addressing masters, people who owned slaves. And he said, masters, uh, people who own slaves, give up threatening your slaves, knowing that their master, Christ, and your master, Christ, is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Or in Romans 14, he says, with respect to the fact that there were some in the Roman community, some ate food and some, some didn't eat, um, and they were, they were bickering about that. <clears throat> and so Paul said, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess, and give praise to God. So then, each one of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather judge this. Don't put stumbling blocks in front of each other. So he, he gives this moral exhortation, stop judging each other, stop making each other stumble, lift each other up, etc. and he grounds it in the exhortation that the one who's enthroned in heaven is the judge of all of us. Um, okay, next one. We have an authoritative teacher on the throne. This is, uh, this is from Matthew 28. This is, this is, I'm kind of fudging a bit on this one because it's sort of right after his resurrection and right as he's about to ascend. But Matthew, in Matthew 28, Jesus says, look, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. And then people start to mumble because they don't like the next part. Right, what does he say? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Because Christ, as the one with the authority over all the nations, having received all this authority in heaven and earth, is now the one who properly rules over the nations. But he doesn't just sort of rule them. He instructs them. He teaches them. And so he sends the disciples out to these nations and says, come, not only tell them to, you know, to, to come serve, to serve God through my lordship, but also show them what it means to be human. Teach them to live this way, the way that I, Christ, have taught you. And we, of course, get the, probably the fullest expression of Jesus' teaching in what we now call the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. Matthew 5 through 7. 
And so we have this authoritative teacher on the throne who doesn't simply rule or judge or whatever, but he instructs his people on how they ought to live. My story here, which I won't tell you, was about how I'm really bad at construction and I almost electrocuted myself um, until my friend Adam Hardrick came over and said, "Uh, no, 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 don't connect those wires. Um, And he was my go-to guy for all things when I needed help with uh, uh, fixing really anything. Ask me about that one later if you want. Um, the second one, uh, the next one, is that we, uh, Christ's ascension gives us the grounds for all nations belonging. Prior to Christ's ascension, and obviously still it still is the case, where there is bickering across national or ethnic lines. That's obviously a problem that persists. But in the gospel, with Christ's ascension, this is theoretically and ideally put to an end. This is a big part of Paul's own commissioning where he goes and instructs that all the nations now belong together under one, under one God and their distinctive customs and practices ought no longer be barriers to unity. The different ethnicities and, 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 and um, people groups can now belong together under one Lord and, and because they serve the same Lord, they can live together in harmony. And so the grounds for all nations being included is also hinged upon Christ's ascension because with his ascension, he now has authority over all earthly powers. Um, The last two, we get the spirit itself. It's not until the ascension that Christ gives his spirit to his people. It's at his ascension when he's exalted that he then gives his own spirit to his people. This is honestly perhaps one of the deepest ones for me, or I think for Christians, because it's it's the moment when Christ already gave himself up on the cross, gave gave his own gave his own life for his people. But in this also, it's when he continues to give of himself to his people. The Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. He quite literally gives himself to his people so that he can continue to be with them. And we know that this is just what it takes when you're in a loving, united relationship with, with people. This one's on my mind since it just happened two weeks ago, but I mean, you think about like motherhood. I mean, my, my, my wife just gave birth to our, to our, to our, our third child, Elizabeth, and I mean, quite literally, she has given herself to this. She gave of her own life to give life to Elizabeth. That's hard. It's painful, it's hard. It's not a single moment. She carried the baby for nine months and is, now it's weeks after and you're still just things that go on. I mean, it's, she's constantly giving of herself for the life of her child. It's difficult, but it's really beautiful. And this is the picture of Christ's relationship with his people. He didn't just give himself up in a moment. He continues to give of himself to his people. He gave his own spirit to his people. This is from Luke 24, 49, where he says, Behold, I am sending forth my promise of my Father upon you. You stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And then he ascends, and from his ascended state, he then gives his spirit. And the reason why this is actually so important is because he doesn't simply give his spirit while he was down on earth. It's the fact that he gave his spirit after he was resurrected from the dead. The, the, the New Testament actually makes a subtle but very strong point about this. He gave his spirit after he was resurrected from the dead. That means that it's the spirit of his immortal body that he gives to his people. He didn't give the spirit of his own mortal body, the kind of body that we have, the kind of body that's still subject to death and decay. He gave the spirit of his immortal body to his people. And the reason this is subtle but all very monumentally important is because the fact that it's that spirit, the spirit of his own immortal body that's been given to us, and that's the guarantee that our mortal bodies will no longer stay this way. Our bo- bodies that are now subject to death and decay won't always be that way because we have the spirit of the immortal one residing in us, and we're a guarantee that we'll be raised to new life. Last one, we have constant intercession. This is the best story, but I feel like I'm going long. 
Okay, so here we go. Mike's going to tell it. Um, so constant intercession. Intercession is when something goes wrong and someone mediates on your behalf. So I, uh, we have a lot of student workers at HBU, they're HCU, uh, Houston Christian. They're great. Um, this student worker did, made some funny choices in his uh, employment. Um, he didn't always, like, do the right thing, right? Um, so he's, uh, I'll say, he's kind of on thin ice. Uh, um, well, one day we were, uh, don't tell my boss this. I have to, I'm going to tell him later. Uh, it's a funny story. I'm going to tell him later, but he doesn't know yet. So I've got to, I'll, I'll break it to him later. Um, we were doing a video shoot in my boss's office, uh, Phil Talon's office. And, uh, we were setting up this thing. We had to set up a screen. We had to set up a, a blanket behind it to like block the light. Um, and when we were in there, this student worker like elbowed like, uh, the bookshelf and knocked off a, uh, a, a, um, bookend. It looked like a very fancy one that had been imported from a foreign country. Um, fell on the ground, and the monkey uh, now was a headless monkey. Uh, the head came full off. Um, and this student worker's face just melted. He was so nervous. He was like, that's it, I'm fired. Like, that's what his belief was. And I was like, okay. <laughs> All right, let me think for a second. He's like, I don't know what to do. I was like, I, it's okay, I'm going to take care of it. Just, just don't say anything, okay? And he's like, okay, okay, okay. And so I take it. Uh, my mom also doesn't know the story. I then went to my parents' house, which was on campus, and I got some super glue that I thought was super glue. Um, and I get there, and I took it back to my office, and apparently this was a, kind of a super glue that if you read the directions really closely, it says, do not use indoors. This is a deep chemical burn. Like, must be outside, best to wear a mask, wear an open field. You know, I didn't read that. I open it up, I mix it with, it's like, it's the kind of thing, it's like a, it's a paste that you have to combine with water to then form as an adhesive. I do that, and it immediately smells like my office is on fire. It smells like someone's burning a tire on my desk in my office. And it smells so obvious. And, I, and I'm like, well, this stuff better work. And it does. It works really well. I get the monkey head glued back on. It's perfect. But now I've got to like hold it together because it's like hold for four hours. And I'm like, I should have read this label before I used this. Um, it worked really well. But now the problem is, is like everyone who walks in the hallway is like, hey, man, do you smell that? It kind of smells like burning in here. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't smell anything. Do you sure? I think it's someone maybe Celeste has a candle going or something. Um, I didn't tell him. I then was like, I hope he doesn't notice that the bookend is not on his shelf. And so I take it to my parents' house to dry for like, it's just like, let it dry for 48 hours. And I was like, this was the worst sitcom episode I've ever gotten into. I finally, after like the next day, I take it back. I put it on his shelf. I then ask him, like, hey, man, can you tell me a little bit about this bookend? Like, where'd you get it? Um, just because I want to make sure it wasn't like some like family heirloom. He's like, oh, it's from Pier 1. I don't even know where I got it. I was like, oh, <laughs> thank goodness. All right, cool. He's like, why do you ask? He's like, no reason. I'll tell you later. <laughs> um, This story is not identical to what Christ does for us on behalf of us, but now you won't forget what Christ does for us, right? He mediates on behalf between the offending party and the, and the one who might be offended, right? And he, and he solves the problem. Here's what Christ does in Hebrews 7. It says, as the former priests, on the one hand, they existed in great numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing, but Christ, on the other hand, because he lives forever, is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He's always alive, always at the right hand of the Father, and can always intercede for those who need him. So he says, for it was fitting that we should have a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. So with our exalted Lord, we have one who instructs, forgives, will judge in the future, but constantly intercedes for us as one who lived this life that we live and is, knows our own weaknesses and so is able to be a faithful and merciful high priest on our behalf. So don't forget all the awesome things that we get through the exaltation of Christ because there are many. Father in heaven, thanks for this day. Thanks for this time together. Thanks for these people. Thanks for this chance to worship and to sing and to learn from your scriptures and to be thankful for all the great things Christ has done for us. We love you, Lord. We trust you. We pray these things in the name of your son. Amen.
Indeed, we have all heard from God this morning, and we will together respond as a congregation. And I hope that you will also, as an individual, uh, respond by recommitting today yourself uh, to living in the way that Christ has called you to live, to living for Him, uh, to living with Him in all that we do. Our hymn of commitment this morning is actually found here in your bulletin. Uh, this is a hymn that is familiar, I think. Uh, well, I know it is familiar to some of you, uh, maybe not as familiar to others, but it's not in our hymnal, but it is so appropriate for today. Um, oh, love that will not let me go. We'll sing uh, here from the bulletin. If you would, would you join me in standing to sing? so much for being here uh, this morning as part of the Heights Church family for this most special hour, and our day together is not over. You are all invited uh, in a moment as soon as we have received our benediction to join us on the third floor for a baby shower. It's been a long time since we had a baby shower around here, and today's shower is very, very special. I mean, they're all special, but today's is very special because we celebrate four, count them, one, two, three, four babies uh, being born here within a, just a span of a few months, and they're all four girls. Oh my goodness. I'm not exactly sure what that means, good or bad, but I think we're in for something. Um, so um, I want to mention that uh, while Meg Sloan is not here today, uh, Paul Sloan is, and so you can give him your congratulations uh, to Meg that he'll pass along. Uh, also, Laura Chester is not here, but my goodness gracious, Marcus Chester is here, and we sure have have prayed for you. Um, we're so happy to see you. Uh, as well, uh, so Tyler and Anna Maria waved, to, you know Tyler and Anna Maria, but waved to everybody. They're also having their first baby that, and any minute now, right? Maybe today. <laughs> Maybe, we don't know. Could be today. Good, we don't, okay, soon. Uh, and also, finally, Vanessa. Vanessa, would you just kind of wave to us? She's right here. If you have not met Vanessa, she and Darian Marsland, who's our security officer, uh, they are also having their first baby. Uh, this is a very exciting thing. So, 
in a moment, uh, you take the stairs or the elevator to the third floor. You, you won't be able to miss the party. There's plenty of food. If you brought gifts, that's wonderful. Uh, if not, go ahead and come and at least have something to eat, right? Join us. Uh, everyone is invited. Final thing I have to tell you, next Sunday, next Sunday is Memorial Weekend, but the more important thing about next Sunday is that it is the day of Pentecost. That is the only, literally the only day of the whole year where the cloth on the altar and here on the choir rail on the platform is red. It is the only single Sunday of the color red. And so what we're going to do, all of us, is wear red. You don't have to dress in all red, obviously. But anything that you have that's red, you have a shirt, you have a jacket, a dress, just, a, I don't know, a hat, I don't know, socks, whatever you have that's red, uh, we, we're going to wear red together next Sunday, the 28th. Wear red for Pentecost. Uh, and that is essentially the birthday of, not of Heights Church, but the birthday of the church universal uh, when the Holy Spirit blessed the church. And so we're all going to wear red next Sunday. Don't forget it. I'll remind you. Now, you receive your benediction. Following that, I'll see you all upstairs. Peace be to the whole community in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have an undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.